Well, it isn't just Joseph. I think some people have tried to interpret it, you know, the farm boy, limited education, and these kinds of things. The implication being that Charles Anton or Sidney Rigdon or, you know, Hugh Nibley or anybody could have done it. This isn't true. There isn't anybody that in their own mind could create this text. And I think that is a very important thing to finally realize, that it isn't a question of Joseph Smith. It's a question of anybody being able to construct such a text. I mean, even with all the knowledge we have, and you could get somebody individually inspired or, heaven forbid, a committee and say, we want you to make this scripture up. Uh, of, uh, you couldn't find people on the earth that could do it. They, they would fail. They would fail to match what we actually have. One, because it's an actual history, and they would have to make it up. And second of all, it represents a language, as we're discovering, that no one really here upon the earth currently has. So I don't like to put it in the framework of Joseph Smith couldn't do it. No one can do it. It has to come from the Lord. Um, but what is important about Joseph Smith is he is the transmitter of the text. And we don't always appreciate that aspect of it. Now, he called himself the translator, but all the evidence suggests that he, when he uses the word translate, it means transmitter. It's being transmitted through him, transferred through him. So he is a seer, a person that sees through instruments a text. It's a gift from God. Book of Mormon prophets had it. Uh, King Benjamin had it, and uh, presumably Mosiah had this gift. And uh, Moroni would have had it, and working with the plates, uh, the ether's gold plates, and Mormon would have had it. Um, but this is the gift. And in a way, when we refer to uh, sustain our prophets as prophets, seers, and revelators, that seer just gets passed by very quickly. But this is the right to use one of these instruments for receiving a text from God. And Joseph Smith had this gift. And that is something that he did do. So that, that is something we need to keep in mind about him as the translator. And in the 1830 edition, in the preface, he refers to himself as the translator, but for uh, copyright purposes, he put on the title page that he was the proprietor and the author but that's simply because the, the law said that they gave copyright to proprietors and authors, and he just covered his bases by putting both of them on. Mormon and Nephi, they wrote these histories in their language on these plates using characters, and there's some discussion what these characters were and so forth. Yes, they did, but that isn't what is given to Joseph Smith. He's given a translation into English. And s somehow that's got to be done. You got to go from that language on the plates to the text appearing in the instrument for Joseph Smith to read it. And that's the big issue. And that isn't being, as far as I can tell, done by any of the Book of Mormon prophets, per se. It is true, someone can say, well, they learned enough English, and we see this and that. You're just imagining all this, of course, because we have no evidence of how that text, English language text, is being prepared. 
the translated text, uh, the, uh, the Lord said, the voice of the Lord said, the translation is correct. And what he's referring to is what was given in the instrument, not what they wrote down. They made mistakes. They're already making mistakes. But they were given a correct translation. Even though it may record errors that Mormon made or Moroni, that doesn't matter. And, uh, and we are getting some literalisms in the Book of Mormon, some Hebraisms and some other things that are interesting that may reflect upon what was actually on the plates, but so much of it is independent of what would have been on the plates. So uh, scriptures are being quoted uh, in the King James uh, text versions that doesn't, don't exist yet in terms of what Mormon or Nephi might have written down on plates. So uh, the translation of the text is a marvelous work and a wonder in and of itself. And we have really no idea what the actual characters represented and the language that it represents and so forth. But I do want to make a comment about that word translate. When we look at Joseph Smith's use of the word, he, um, he will sometimes refer to real translations uh, that we expect where somebody has a text and they know the language and they know the language they're going to translate into, and they, they look at that text, they think about it, and they write it down. Joseph Smith isn't doing that. There's no way that he's actually translating. He's transmitting a, a prepared text. The evidence is just completely there. But Joseph Smith says things like, um, we believe in the Bible as far as it's been translated correctly. We also believe in the Book of Mormon. Well, what does he mean when he says we believe in the Bible as far as it's been translated correctly? Does that mean in the sort of sense that we take it now that, uh, well, then all we have to do is go read the Greek New Testament or the Hebrew Old Testament, the languages they were written in, there's no errors in those. Well, anybody that knows anything about those knows there's lots of variation. There are lots of errors. We can't even recover it from the earliest forms we have of the you know, Hebrew Bible or the, the New Testament, and we're not going to. I mean, unless the Lord reveals it. So the point being that we have this, Joseph Smith is saying, really, we believe in the Bible as far as it's been transmitted correctly. That's right, we do. We believe these are inspired works, and, uh, but there are problems in them. But he could have actually added, we believe in the Book of Mormon as far as it's been transmitted correctly. But he didn't realize the kinds of errors uh, that were entering in. But they weren't the kinds of conscious errors of, you know, we've got to clean up our Book of Mormon here and change the doctrine and things like that. You do have those kinds of things in the Bible, so we don't have that. So in any event, even that article of faith is fraught with linguistic terminology that we aren't prepared to really understand, I think. In any case, uh, the really miraculous thing, Joseph Smith is doing a miraculous thing. He is a seer. And as far as I know... He's really the only one in this dispensation who has been a full, complete seer who has received texts. Other brethren have received inspired messages and perhaps even words in their minds or hearing them and things like that, and visions and so forth. We have Joseph F. Smith with the vision of the dead, but that isn't being given as a literal text, and he didn't go and get the, the 
to sear stone out of the, uh, the church, which the church already had. And didn't use that as far as, you know, he had a, a vision, a dream vision. In any case, Joseph Smith's, that, that first revelation and some of the early doctrine and covenants seem to have been done through the seer stone instrument type approach as well. But later doctrine and covenant ones aren't being done that way, so there is a shifting in the nature. In any case, that's what I think. So I don't, I don't really like, it is true Joseph Smith can't construct this book, but nobody can. Nobody can. I challenge anybody to try and come up with a, such a text. There's evidence that Mark Hoffman was trying to prepare the 116 pages, the lost 116 pages that he had found part of them and uh, he sent a few sentences to Ashworth and says, this is what's on this document. And, and, and um, one of the sentences was sort of cribbed off of the small plates, but the other seven he just made up. And they were so bad. They were so un book of mormon -ish. And you, you look at them and you just, you, you say, well, let's, ha let's have a look, see how these match. They don't match at all. They're awful. And so later Hoffman came back to Ashworth and says, oh, I discovered that these were a forgery. <laughs> you sure did. But what he really discovered is he couldn't do it. He could not create pages of the 116 pages. And there's a guy out here, the prophet Namelka, who's restored the 116 pages and the sealed portion. I'm sorry to mention it, but I think people ought to go look at his rubbish. I'll call it rubbish because he can't do it either. And he's got modern phrases and language and stuff that just couldn't be in the 116 pages. You know, they cannot do it, no matter how talented they might be. And Joseph Smith couldn't have done it either, in my opinion. We, um, but uh, people, from, right in the beginning, you know, well, it had to be that Spalding guy from Pittsburgh, or Sidney Rigdon was sneaking in, and Oliver Cowdery, the smarter one, was doing this, and so forth. And uh, that won't work either. I don't care who you put together, they can't do it. The six bona fide witnesses that observe the translation process you have to deal with the fact that it's in an open setting. He has got the instrument in a hat. The hat is set on the table. The instrument is put in it. He puts his head up to it. There are no books, manuscripts, notes, Bible, anything that he's using. And he will dictate uh, a number of, you know, apparently he would do a certain amount. And then the scribe would read it back. They would check. And if it seemed okay, they would go on. There are six people that say this is the way it occurred. They go from the 116 pages right to the end to the, at the Whitmer home. Two of them wrote them down in their own hand. Four of them uh, gave interviews. And the interviews are published in a short period of time. Now, you know, you can say, well, he did it by sleight of hand. He, he just, you know, had a false hat, and he somehow had the text already prepared and so forth. You know, there have been these, well, yes, you can imagine anything. You know, he couldn't see a thing, and he was just making it up out of his head. Okay, you know. But it's quite... You know, I mean, people can come up with all kinds of imaginary ways. But the evidence is pretty much right there. This is what he's doing. He doesn't have the plates out. They are wrapped up. So they have to be in the vicinity. Uh, but they are not being directly used. Now, I, that's, I just want to say, you know, if you're going to fake a text... Why not just do it in your own private room and come out, here's the revelation from God, and work on it and get it all fixed up and bring it out? 
Why are you going through this ridiculous show month after month and you're going to do this performance, you know, approximately six hours a day? Think about this. If you're going to fake it, gosh, let's just do it in the back room behind the curtain like everybody said, you know. Well, when he, he used the curtain only when he was working with the plates alone and he didn't have a scribe, and it was only in the very beginning. And, uh, but basically the 116 pages was given through the normal method, the instrument in the hat. So two of them think that Joseph is seen one of the characters, just one, from the plates in his image. And underneath it is the sentence that translates the character. Now, number one, we know of no language in the world where this is the way it works, where one character stands for a whole sentence. But David Whitmer seemed to believe that and Joseph Knight Sr., but let's ask ourselves, did they witness this? No, they didn't. They're not looking in the instrument, seeing what this looks like. So it's either hearsay or them imagining it, one of the two. And David did say it one time. Joseph said this is what he saw, a character and a translation. Now, it is possible that the character was just a trigger to say, this character and the following characters are what I'm translating. Who knows? But it still doesn't make any difference. They don't know. They can't be witnesses of what Joseph Smith is doing. Nobody is. That is a problem. Nobody gets... Joseph doesn't say, come here, Oliver, I want you to look too. So we have a witness of what I'm seeing here. It never happened. Nobody else did it, and, jo and Oliver never translated. There's this idea that he did translate for a little bit and failed is wrong. Uh, he was trying to get inspiration, a feeling from the Spirit that he should do it, and the Spirit wouldn't let him do it. And uh, he had the wrong attitude. He thought, the farm boy can do it, I can do it, you know? I can look in the hat and see the things. So... In any case, um, the point I'm making is why go through this rigmarole for month after month? In the spring of 1828, he's doing it. And when he gets, he gets back the instrument and the plates and starts again, he does it with Oliver Cowdery all the way to the end. He has other scribes. It's all in the open. One of them is not even a member, never joins the church. It's Emma's, it's Emma's brother-in-law, and he comes in and he sees this thing, and our LDS guys interview him later in his life, and they said, what did you think of this? He says, I don't know what to think of it. He was doing it, <laughs> and it's the stone in the hat. Every one of them have an instrument in the hat and nothing else, and dictating and the scribe writing back. Several of them mention he spells out the Book of Mormon names, the difficult names. Emma says that at the very beginning he couldn't pronounce words of English sometimes, so he'd spell those out too. Maybe. We don't have the 116 pages, so we don't know. We can't find evidence for that. All of them do have one theory expression, almost all of them, not, not quite, but when they talk about it, it's sort of weird. They say the instrument wouldn't let them make a mistake not even in spelling what they wrote down. Now, first of all, they can't witness this. They can't witness the instrument preventing. It's Joseph will have to say, we can't go on, there's some mistake, okay? But they are not actually seeing this problem, whatever it is. The second thing is the manuscript shows it couldn't have happened. There are mistakes in the manuscript. There's garbage written sometimes, and it was written down and it went on. And the words, and they all seem to think the words are going to be spelled in standard spelling correctly. First of all, they don't even know, half of them, what standard spelling is. So this statement of theirs must be thrown out. 
that the instrument is controlling it. The instrument is not controlling it. But they couldn't actually witness it. Because what you would have to do is you'd have to look at what the scribe wrote, and then you'd have to look yourself and say, oh, yeah, there's a, there's a difference. I see it. Okay, I can see why the instrument somehow knows the scribe is goofed. Now, they seem to believe this. Where does it come from? I think it comes from them witnessing the spelling out of the names. So they see the spelling out of the names, and they think, aha, it must be spelled correctly. We, the instrument will not allow any misspellings and so forth. Well, it isn't the instrument. It's just the scribe says, hey, I don't know how to spell this. And Joseph says, okay, Zenith, Z-E-N-O-C-H, not, oh, I got C-K. Okay, cross it out. Okay, so he crosses it out. But what does he do later? He misspells it. Did the instrument let him do it? Yeah, it did. You can spell a name correctly the first time and start misspelling it later, and it's incorrect. So we have to look, we have to say, okay, these people believe that there's going to be no mistake in the spelling. They can't witness that, but they could witness the spelling out of names, and that's where we do find evidence. We find it misspelled the first time, crossed out, written in line the correct spelling. So they had to have stopped and said, how do you spell that? And then Joseph spells it. So we can find evidence in the manuscripts for some of the things, the things that they could actually witness, the things that they're speculating on, no misspellings, no errors. You know, once they write Ishmael and his whole whole, and also his whole whole, that's what the scribe writes. It's Ishmael, I think it's Ishmael, and also his whole household, whole household. Other, Oliver, when he copied it, thought it was Ishmael and his household. But it can't be Ishmael and his whole whole. That's wrong. Even if you spell the first whole with W-H, it's still wrong, I think. I think it's garbage. You know, you can't put that in your Book of Mormon. So, so what we have to we have to be hard nosed here and say, okay, what the what these six witnesses could see, we can find evidence for it. What they really are speculating about, we actually don't find evidence for it. They're wrong. But you also notice there there's there's some other comments. I think David said and Emma, I forget, said that he could just start up no matter where he was. You didn't have to prompt him and say, what were my last words? You know, if I were dictating a letter, you'd say, you know, I might say, what did I last dictate? So you would read them off. Okay, so now we'll, do, we'll go on from there. Never had to do that, according to one, I think one or two. So you get these one or two, but that, that works. Um, and uh, uh, several of them, though, said the person, the scribe would read back what had been dictated. This is how they're checking it. They aren't checking it by just the instrument magically figuring it out. So the instrument is doing its job by just giving it to Joseph. Joseph has some way to move the screen, but how, we don't know. When he's done and he feels like, yeah, we got it down, I dictated it, the scribe read it back to me, and it seems right, we can go ahead. But in one place, he says, my son, see, one son. The scribe wrote, my sons, see, plural, but there's only one son in the story. It's Alma talking to Corianton. The scribe read it back, my sons, see, my son, see. Joseph hears it. Oh, yeah, my son, see. Yeah, that's right. Let's go on but the original's got an error. It's got a plural. Well, you can figure it out, you know, but it, 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 the instrument didn't say beep, 
<laughs> no flashing red light for Joseph say there's something wrong. You got to fix it. It went on. And if you say, well, then the instrument's deciding what's important or not, you know, I mean, you, you've got that instrument becoming this really omniscient, you know, howl of 2001, figuring out what's going on. So, I mean, you know, I, I'm just, I, what I'm doing is saying, I think this was a much more sophisticated operation than we have ever thought of, of what's going on here. It is somehow viewing a text on a primitive screen, and, and, and I think if you read, if you read 2 Nephi 27, the Lord says he will give back the plates and the words, and he will tell, and Joseph will read off the words that I will give him. And so I think he gave him the words of English, not Mormon or, you know, Nephi. Ultimately, the only thing you have is what the scribes wrote down. You have this text. You look at the text and you see, well, he's not revising it generally, you know. The only revisions we ever see is Oliver Cowdery doing it on his own. He didn't like something. He adds a phrase, or he, when he gets when he gets done and he's going to copy it into the into the printer's manuscript to make the copy, he notices, oh, there's something missing here. So he adds it in the printer's, and then he adds it in the original. I mean, Oliver Oliver does revisions, minor, trying to. I've got to got to help the text along. Joseph's never doing this. When Joseph supposedly does corrections, the only corrections you ever get are ones that were actually, it looks like Mormons or Moroni's or Nephi's. They're called the corrective or, where you get the text going along and it says something like the uh, weapons of, of, of weapons of peace, and they says, or the weapons of war for peace. And well, why not? Why not just get rid of that or and just say the weapons of, of, of war? You know, it's as even if you added four piece because you knew you'd already made this mistake. So I, is Joseph going through this rigmarole where he will never correct a mistake he's made except to do an or? You know, that's what they have to say. Well, I don't think so. I think most people have suggested, yeah, they're doing plates, and you don't want to hammer out plates and redo it because you make it too thin. So you just do an or and just go on. And um, so what you end up with is a text that is essentially dictated, and it's already prepared. It's already, there's no evidence Joseph Smith is sort of revising his translation. Now, I've done translation, and I can't do that. I can't do a translation straight off in the middle of my mind and not make corrections. The only corrections I could make would be or corrections. It, it would all make sense. I'd just keep it going and just make it all one nice, uncorrected string. You know, normal translation is just full of revisions. So you can't say Joseph Smith is getting the ideas and putting in his own words and then just dictating it raw because if you did that, you'd want to make corrections, and he just doesn't do this. Just, it's like the thing's already been done. It's already been completely done, but there's no paper. Everybody, everybody says there's only the hat and the stone. All six of them are saying that. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's a marvelous work and a wonder. You know, the Palmyra Library is very good. It's got Coverdale. It's got the Septuagint. It's got all these old archaic texts. He could have been going down there. Well, of course not. But there's no library in the world that's got it. 
I mean, I don't really care about the Joseph Smith arguments. I'm, I'm trying to say we've got to get off this idea that Joseph Smith can't do it. Nobody can do it. This thing is too good to be anybody on the planet or a committee of people on the planet, the best scholars you can get from Oxford and whatever, and putting together a text. What we discovered is really hundreds of words and phrases that aren't in Joseph Smith's language. Or they're all over the place, and some of them have been edited out, and some haven't, so uh, they will say, we're going to make you extinct. We're going to kill you. Well, the word extinct originally in early modern English meant to put out your light, your fire, kill you. But it became to mean to wipe out a group of people so they don't have offspring. And by the time of Joseph Smith, that's its meaning. So do you be using extinct in a 1600? It's just not expected. Departed. The original text talks about the, the Red Sea being departed instead of parted by Moses. The typesetter, it was in the printer's manuscript, he just changed it to parted. He thought it was an error. But in early modern English, in all the Bibles and everything, up to the King James Bible, they talked about the departing of the Red Sea. And there, even they departed my raiment, referring to Jesus after where he's being crucified. They parted it, but the word originally was departed it. But by 1600, the word, had be, that meaning for depart became archaic. So they took it out of the King James Bible. There's no uses of depart in the King James Bible, meaning to part or to separate. There are ones to mean to leave, to go somewhere. So they're all removed. You can't get it from the Bible, but there it is sitting in the Book of Mormon. So, well, you just have to say, oh, there's another error, Joseph. Or it says, the Lord's, uh, Alma says to Helaman, counsel the Lord in all your doings. All thy doing. Counsel the Lord. It's good. Tell him. We love it. But it means counsel with the Lord. Talmud changed it in 1920. Put in the with. Maybe he thought the with had dropped out. But it turns out in the 1500s, you would say, counsel your family. Meaning, get counsel from your family. And that's the way the word was used. It drops out about 1600. It's gone from English, but it's twice in the Book of Mormon. Both Alma talking to Corianton, talking to Helaman. He doesn't put with in. So um, there's, um, there's even ones we don't recognize. When Jacob says, I got mine Aaron from the Lord. Well, we interpret that to mean I got my task from the Lord to tell you what I'm supposed to talk about today. But Aaron originally meant message. I got my message from the Lord, and that's what he really means, not task. And in the next chapter, he says, the angel told me to take this message to you. He uses the word message. He doesn't use the word Aaron. So we're misreading the text all the time because it's got all these archaic things. So, um, and I've gone through the whole vocabulary. There's nothing in it. There's nothing in it that isn't already about 100 years old. The book is about 100 years old. The vocabulary. The vocabulary is about 100 years old. In 1830, it's already 100 years old. It's archaic. Everything's old. If you were making up a text, could you stop yourself from using words and phrases that came into the language 10 years ago, 20, 30, 40, 50? Probably not. You wouldn't even know. You wouldn't even know what was more recent, unless it was slang, from further. But the Book of Mormon... About the, we're getting a few things that came in maybe 1730 into English. So they're in the Book of Mormon, so they're coming in. 
But after about 1730, there's nothing. It's just sort of blank. So the text. So how's, how's, how's Joseph Smith going to do this? Or anybody do it? How can you do it? How can Namelka couldn't do it? Why, well, he's got words that came into English in 1920s, 1960s. He talks about depression and drug addictions and so forth, which, you know, are, are really modernisms. He doesn't even care. He doesn't even think about this. Well, Joseph Smith isn't thinking about it either. But this is the way it ended up. And so the, you get all this vocabulary, which is old. Now, I know a lot of people, they sit there and say, well, why would the Lord do it this way, you know? And I have to say, well, I don't know. You just have to ask him, you know? But we're studying it. And we're not just declaring, well, upstate New York is some dialect relic area, and they just kept the old words and, you know, and so forth. It's rather doubtful, you know? But I would say, go find them then. See if you can find them. We've been looking. We've been looking. You guys just say, oh, they were there. We just know they were this way, you know. Okay, so vocabulary is a very serious kind of consideration. He uses nay and yay, and he doesn't have any contractions, and he, you know, it's, it's really biblical sounding in so many regards. So there's none of that either. But there's nothing... There's nothing, say, that came in in 1770 that he wouldn't know was more recent. It just They just don't appear. Why? Who knows? But there's more to it, okay? There's going to be two more things we're going to look at here. Ado is nothing. Ado was borrowed into English in the 1300s from French when the French speakers, the Norman French, became English speakers. And they brought it along, and it became the most frequent way to say farewell. Farewell was the old English way. Adieu means God by you, God be with you. And goodbye came about 50 years after adieu. It's English, it's modeled after adieu. But even through Shakespeare's time, adieu is the common, most common way to say goodbye. And Hicks say it. Sophisticated people say it. Everybody says adieu. Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream to his fellow workers, bumpkins, you know, out in, the, out in the woods in the middle of night say adieu to each other. They don't say goodbye. They don't say farewell. They don't say das Vidanya. They say adieu. It ain't French. That is, historically, of course it's French. But nobody knows it's French, you know? So anyway, nobody know today knows that goodbye is based on French. It's what we call a loan translation. Well, in any event, okay, so you have adieu is nothing. In fact, it dropped out of English in about the 1880s and 90s, started becoming sort of French. People thought, oh, this is French. And we, and we But people complained about it in the Book of Mormon beginning in 1950. We don't have, uh, we couldn't find any complaints about a do before 1950. So nobody back in the 1850s was saying, oh, this a do, this is French and stuff like that. So it isn't even an issue. But it is in English. It just, it's not one of the interesting words, actually. Uh, he would have would have used it. And the other one, you know, they get farewell in the Book of Mormon, too. You don't get goodbye. It's interesting. But you get farewell and you get adieu once. Well, in any event, so the real big one on Joseph Smith being the author, the maker of this translation, is the bad English. And, and even our church scholars for decades have been promoting the idea that it was in bad English. Things like, in them days, they was yet wroth, this kind of thing. And since we know only Hicks talked this way, this is Joseph Smith. This is God. This can't be God. God doesn't speak bad English. He talks like me. He speaks good English. So, 
People basically said this is the evidence we have of Joseph Smith being the creator of this text. Well, once I started finding vocabulary coming from, from 1540 to about 1730, I said, why don't I, I'm going to go look at some of the bad grammar. And I only looked at one at first. Myself, I just looked at in them days. Occurs a couple times in the Book of Mormon, some other thems, you know, in them days. We expect it from Geneva Road language around here. There's a Geneva Road back there in, in New York, too. The road to Geneva. People there probably said, in them days. Okay. Well, I looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary. And in 1600, there are guys writing academic books, scholars, in London. They write, in them days. So wait a minute. Maybe when Joseph Smith is doing in them days, it's because actually it was in them days on the screen and he read it off. It wasn't because he, it, it, he got the idea in those days and then he just said in them days, you know, but it was actually there. So a colleague of mine who's now working with me on the project, Stan Carmack, decided, I'm going to look at all the bad grammar. And basically, except for a handful of residual items, which we haven't found, everything, everything that's said to be bad grammar in the Book of Mormon is early modern English used in writing. We've got it in written forms, printed forms, not just some some hick from Somerset, England, or something like that. These are people that are writing books that use these things. Even they was, you was, these kinds of things. We got a few of those. It occurs at a low frequency in early modern English. It occurs at a low frequency in the Book of Mormon. They jump out at you when you see them, but most of the time it's saying, ye were or you were, not you was. But there's a couple in the Book of Mormon, and they, there's, they occur. So, and we're not talking about non-academic, you know, plays where they're representing peasants or something like that. These are just written academic works. And you could say, well, it's the typesetter. The typesetter was drunk and just did this or something. Well, we, you know, you just got to look at the evidence, and the evidence, it came through that, we have been making a mistake, assigning the bad grammar and just saying this is Joseph Smith's contribution. He's the author of the translation. It doesn't hold. And we have found expressions which have never been edited out, which are very particular uses, like the excess use of did, and they did go used excessively in the Book of Mormon about 20 to 30 percent of the time. It doesn't come from the Bible. The Bible uses it about 2% of the time and most of the time with did eat. And the Book of Mormon doesn't use did eat that much. So uh, Stan went in, Stan Carmack went in and studied all this use of did and he found that it basically models the use of did in from about 1550 to 1570. You can put dates on when did was used excessively in English, what we would consider excessively. Uh, when people have tried to write novels and histories in the early 1800s imitating King James style, they don't put in these extra do's like did and so forth because the Bible doesn't have them either, really very much, about 2%. So they put it in at a very low frequency. So here's Joseph Smith putting them in at about 20 to 30 percent. Well, I don't think it's Joseph Smith putting them in. They're in this text. Well, okay, that's, this has been a very important find because it takes away the last refuge of those that say the Book of Mormon's written by Joseph Smith because it's got bad grammar in it. 
So when I decided in the Yale edition to put all the bad grammar back in, I was putting back in the revealed words that were given. I wasn't putting back in Joseph Smith's Hick language. That's what people were claiming that I was doing. Okay, now there's one other thing, though, we have to consider. Some people have said, I even entertained it a while, well, maybe God didn't do the translation of the Book of Mormon, that he had a committee. I'm gonna, I'll state it. I've stated it once. I don't state it anymore because I don't believe it. And God had a committee, though, of Protestant reformers, you know, in England, English guys that had died and got them all together and said, you know, here's the translation. I want you to do this Book of Mormon for me, and we're going to give it to Joseph Smith down the road or something. So, uh, you know, so this is the committee idea, you know, and these guys are from the 15 and 1600s. Now, first of all, the committee has to go f from before 1540, and it's got to go up to 1730 because you got vocabulary that some is coming in and so forth. So it's a mix. That's one of the things. But, you know, you can, you can imagine lots of things. Just because I can imagine it doesn't mean it happened this way. But then there's one real problem with this theory of the committee. So this is the problem. Stan and I were sitting there studying early modern English writers. And we got this guy, Harpsfield, who wrote the life story of uh, Sir Thomas More. And he wrote it in about 1557 or so. And Stan is reading it to me. It's in the time period of the kinds of things we've been seeing in the Book of Mormon. And about every other sentence, Stan reads a word that I don't understand at all. So there's something like wean. It doesn't mean to wean a baby. It just, it's in there. W-E-E-N. So we stop, we get out the Oxford English Dictionary and say, okay, let's find this word. We don't know it. We go down a, another couple sentences, we find another word. We don't know it. We got to look it up. So if we have a group of guys, you know, 15, 1600s that are putting together a text, there should be words in there that we don't understand at all. Well, we have that in the Book of Mormon when Isaiah is quoted. Carbuncles, the besom of destruction. We get words, in fact, we have no idea what they mean. And we have to look them up. But when we get to the Book of Mormon, we don't get that kind of vocabulary at all. We may get errand, which means, which means, originally task, or not task, message, but now means task, but it's still in English. So when Joseph Smith says errand, the scribe's going to recognize the word, he'll write it down. Even though the meaning may have changed, the words are still the same. This is true of virtually every word in the Book of Mormon. They're all understandable to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery as far as words go. They haven't dropped out of the language. Whereas if I read a 1570 book, I'm going to find, oh, I don't know this word. I don't know that word. Stan, what is this? We're going to have to look it all up. And when we read Isaiah and the Book of Mormon, we've got to look up all these words that irritate us, all these women's with, women with their wimples and their, you know, all their paraphernalia they're wearing. What are these things? And, you know, we like some notes. we got to be told. But you don't have to do that with the rest of the Book of Mormon. What does this mean? Well, it means that the translation is being prepared for Joseph Smith so that he can read it off and the scribe can write it down and they will recognize the words even though they may not recognize their meanings quite right. So they departed the Red, the, the Red Sea, departed. You know the word depart. You can write depart. You're okay. Even though you don't realize, well, it means parted here, you know. 
you don't you don't recognize the old word extinct you still have the word extinct but you you use it differently so however this text is being prepared it's being prepared for Joseph Smith's time it's being sort of filtered so there won't be the besoms in there and the carbuncles and the wimples so it can't be that there's some committee that just got together and put it all together and says, okay, we've done our job, I would just wait for Joseph Smith. So I think it shows, well, however this translation is prepared, it's being prepared for Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and the other scribes. And the Lord has his hand in it. He's overseeing it. It isn't just sort of been done you know, when you get this idea of a committee, you sort of think, oh, it was done and it's just sort of sitting there and now we can just wait for Joseph Smith. Well, no, no, it's, the Lord doesn't just let this thing go. He's preparing it. He's working with it. Ultimately, you know, we're, we're just finding evidence that this text is well-crafted. It looks like it was worked on beginning in the 1500s. But it's, it's been worked on, the translation, for a long time, and it's been worked on going towards Joseph Smith. So we're talking about a long period of time. It's very well controlled. It's got things in it which aren't early modern English, too. It's got these Hebrew, these extra hands, which we've never found. If you come, and surely you should, and I will come, we haven't found in any dialect of English anywhere. Just, But there are lots of them in the Book of Mormon. I've got a whole list, 10 pages of them in the original text. They're in the Book of Mormon. So we're not going to just dismiss them and say, you know, Joseph Smith was had too much beer that day or something, you know? People can come up with all kinds of crazy theories to explain anything. But, but what we want to do is say, what's actually in there? And what does it mean? The conclusion is that it's, it's, a, it's a text that looks like it's controlled word for word, down to the ands. Those extra ands are being put in there. All those and it came to passes are there for reasons, you know. And all the ors, correcting ors, are there for reasons, but they're there. But before we, you know, jump off the cliff, you know, with theories of why they're there, we want to know what exactly it is and uh, where they might be coming from and, and whatnot. So that's... That's what I do, and, um, you know, I think too many people, I, uh, I've already figured out the Book of Mormon, you know, and, and I gave a talk, a theory, a theory. We've already got a theory, and there can be no more theories. And I've given another talk where I change my mind on ten different things because evidence, evidence will make you change your mind. When I started out this project, I thought Joseph Smith got ideas and he put them into his own language. It's the only way I could explain the bad grammar. That's what I thought. But the evidence is becoming, to me, overwhelming that no, that isn't the way it occurred. So I think we have to be able to be willing to change our mind. We have to look at the evidence. And I may change my mind again on various things, you know, but I'm not going to hide it. If I discover I've made a mistake, I'm going to say something and I'm going to put it in writing. I, for 20 years, I said that I thought the reason they used the original manuscript for typesetting one-sixth of the Book of Mormon was they fell behind making the printer's copy. But then I read an article in BYU Studies, made it there were inferences in there and some statements that David Whitmer had made later on that made it really clear that they had finished up the printer's manuscript quickly and taken it to Canada to try and get another edition of the Book of Mormon to protect its copyright. And I've been wrong for 20 years, and I wrote it up, 
and I put it, I published it online first, and then uh, another online version, and then a printed version. I wanted it out there. And uh, I would rather correct myself than somebody else correct me. You know, you find your errors. So it's okay to have... If, if the evidence convinces you otherwise, you know. But we don't want to flip from one thing to another without the basis of having good reasons for doing it. So, so um, but I started out with the idea, Joseph Smith got ideas, and that was his language, and he dictated it. No, everything's against it. Everything is against it.